Hello, hello, and welcome again to another broadcast of a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show that focuses mainly on what's going on in the world of the Beatles, news-wise. I'm Ken Michaels, the host of a syndicated radio show called Every Little Thing, being joined by my co-host, Mr. Beatles Examiner, and many other Examiner columns, including most recently Monkey's Examiner. Mm-hmm. Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Who's uh, who is going to see Michael Nesmith tonight? By the way. All right. But anyway, I'm yeah. going to be seeing him in a few weeks too. Mm-hmm. We're being joined on the phone with Jim Birkenstadt. He is the author of a brand new book called "The Beetle Who Vanished," and this book is all about the life of Jimmy Nickel. And uh, Beetle fans who study history are familiar with the name because he filled in for Ringo on tour with the Beatles when they, the Beatles were about to launch their first world tour in uh, June of 1964. He was a Beatle, actually, for just about two weeks. So, Jim, we welcome you to our show. Thank you, Ken and Steve. It's a real pleasure to be here. Let's start by um, asking you, what made you so interested in the life of Jimmy Nickel? What made you intrigued by, by his story? Well, I think I was always fascinated by the fact that he only ever got one sentence in Beatles history, and I later found by digging further into uh, British music history, he basically got no mention in general music history books coming out of England. And I thought, wow, it's so obscure that this one person would be plucked out of the air for um, 13 or 14 days to um, come and help save the Beatles' first world tour from catastrophe by subbing for Ringo Starr. There must be more to this person's story. And so I originally thought it might just make a nice, interesting article or blog because I didn't feel there was probably enough information out there for a book. But it turns out after starting to interview people in bands that he had played with that he had a fascinating backstory and then a very mysterious post Beatles uh, adventure and story that that led to a lot of mystery and uh, intrigue. Yeah, it's kind of ironic in a way that that he doesn't even get mentioned in a lot of books, like you said. I mean, there are a lot of people who recorded with the Beatles for a day in the studio, like Alan Civil, (laughs) and people know who he is. But Jimmy Nickel was was a, a bona fide Beatle for just about two weeks. So why don't we just backtrack a little bit, and maybe you can tell us some of the bands and the session work that Jimmy was involved with before the Beatles. Sure. I think that that he started out really as a teenager. He left home after learning a little bit about drums in school and in some uh, organizations he was in that were similar to America's Boy Scouts, where he learned some drumming. And uh, he got a job at Boozy and Hawks as a drum repairer, And the key there was that uh, he would always hear about jam sessions and gigs and tryouts before anyone else because that's what people would sit around talking about in the store while their uh, instruments were being repaired. And uh, he found out that the Two Eyes Coffee Club was really the the big place to go in Soho, and and now England calls that the birthplace of their, their rock and roll. And he eventually hooked up there with a band called Colin Hicks and the Cabin Boys. And Colin Hicks was the brother of Tommy Steele, who was one of England's first uh, rock stars and then became an all-around entertainer. And uh, the Colin Hicks band wasn't very popular until they uh, made a movie or were part of a film, which uh, was extremely popular in Italy, which caused them to be asked to come to Italy and do a tour. While on the tour... Jimmy Nickel not only got the experience of dealing with a lot of fans and and lots of live performances, but he also uh, was able to do some of his first early uh, recordings in a studio. So he started to learn what that was like. From there, he went on to uh, another early pop band in England called Vince Eager and the Quiet Three, and he toured with them. In fact, at one point, Uh, He toured Scotland with them at the same time uh, the Beatles were touring Scotland as a backing group. Both had been hired by Larry Parnes, an early pop manager. That was the Johnny General tour, correct? That's right. 
And they're, 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 uh, they, according to Johnny Gentle, who I interviewed for the book, they never crossed paths. So even though Johnny Gentle had played on tours with Jimmy Nickel, and now he was touring with the Beatles, the Beatles didn't get to meet uh, uh, Jimmy Nickel at that <laughs> point in time, although they were crisscrossing on uh, similar tours. That was interesting because I, I was reading that in the book uh, that they, you know, and I wondered if there was any uh, interaction between the two. But that's interesting that they managed to keep out of each other. You know, they never, never, uh, never knew each other back then. At that point, yeah. And then what's interesting is uh, right before the Vince Eager band, Jimmy was actually in a band with Tony, the late Tony Sheridan, who recently passed away. And most Beatle fans are aware that he was. They called him the teacher, and the Beatles learned quite a lot from him in Hamburg, made some of their first recordings with him. And uh, Jimmy Nickel was in a band with Tony Sheridan briefly. And uh, perhaps if he hadn't been moved to Vince Eager, he might have gone to Hamburg and might have, be- meet and met, might have met the Beatles early on in his career. Uh, but then Nickel went into, uh, he sort of graduated to big bands, which had pretty much gone out of uh, uh, style in America, but were still pretty popular in touring uh, England. And that was considered a step up because you had to learn how to sight read music, and you, it was just very serious and professional. From that, uh, one of the trumpet players, Johnny Harris, uh, in the Cyril Stapleton big band, uh, moved over into session work at Pi Studios, and at some point in time, he got a gig where he needed studio musicians to play cover songs of the top hits of that time period. And he enlisted Jimmy Nickel to come over and start doing session work. Uh, And that was a very elite club to get into at the time because people were paid uh, three times, really, what what the normal or the average uh, British worker was paid to go play, say, six hours of uh, sessions at a studio during the day. These things all just sort of, the stars lined up because the songs, most of the songs they were covering at the time for this top six record label were Beatles songs because the Beatles were at the top of the hit parade in uh, early 1964. You've heard those recordings, right? Yes, I've heard them all. Um, Pretty much everything in the discography I've heard, and in fact, uh, Jimmy went into a, into the studio one day, and uh, one of Brian Epstein's stable artists, Tommy Quickly, was there, and uh, Jimmy played drums, and, and there's actually BBC footage, which they shared with me for my research, where I could actually see Epstein watching what Jimmy Nickel was doing uh, during the session. In fact, Epstein wondered why there were two drummers called in for the session because he was pretty budget conscious. Uh, And actually, one was there to play percussion, and Nickel played drums. Do you know what song that was for? It's interesting that that, um, Jimmy was, you know, he he wasn't the... Although Epstein looked at him as a real unknown, you know, he had uh, had some experience behind him that... um, that Jim brought out in the book that that nobody ever he's never gotten enough credit for you know for some of that experience. Yeah, the song uh, that that um, Nickel played on uh, for Tommy Quickly was called "You Might as Well Forget Him," and it's it's sometimes known as "Walk the Streets" because that's in the lyrics. And what's interesting is um, Epstein had gotten the uh, song from singer songwriter Tommy Rowe, an American singer, when Hmm. Tommy Rowe had been on a a concert bill in 1963 with the Beatles, he had suggested to Epstein that one of his artists record this song. And it's actually a pretty cool song, but it didn't do well for Tommy Quickly. Yeah, Tommy did bring Jimmy Nickel to the attention of Brian Epstein. Tommy was a bit of a disappointment because Brian really wanted him to be a big star, and he never quite caught on. Yeah, uh, you know, not, not everybody makes it. Some people do, right. some people don't. Right. right. Just one a question. Good voice, you know, but it just for whatever reason, the people who were buying the records or the DJs just weren't uh, uh, moving him up the charts. 
When he recorded those songs, those cover versions, and he covered Beatles songs, was he in any way copying Ringo's style, or did he just have his own style that he brought to those records? Well, the uh, the rule that was put out by uh, Johnny Harris was that you were supposed to play the uh, parts of each musician that you were covering exactly or as close to exactly as you could. And so what Harris did, because Harris was an arranger, was he would listen to uh, the Beatles' songs that they were going to cover, and he would actually write out the arrangements for Jimmy Nickel and for the other uh, guitar players uh, on those songs. And so Jimmy was actually learning as, as close as as Harris could figure from doing arrangements by ear. Uh, he was um, really replicating Ringo's parts, which made it very easy for him when they called at the 12th hour and said, we're going on tour, come down to EMI Studios, as it was then called, and, and play, with, play, these, play the set list with the Beatles. He, he already knew most of those songs. Hmm. I'm curious, Jim, did you have trouble digging up those nickel records? Well, you know, Steve, I spent about eight total years working on the book, six mm -hmm. doing the research and two more probably trying to assemble all the pieces into order because uh, it was like a big jigsaw puzzle. And I would say during those six, seven years, I was trolling uh, eBay and uh, Gem, I think it's called, records, uh, gem.com. Mm -hmm. which has rare records, and places all over the world. I wasn't just looking at U.S. eBay, but eBay's around the world. And eventually I found everything, and the, I would say the toughest thing to find was an album Jimmy did in Mexico a couple of years after the Beatles called Los Nickelquin. I've never seen one before or after hmm. the one LP that I was able to snag. <laughs> I think because a lot of his records just did not sell that well, so that makes them a little harder to locate, but I, I think there was a lot of um, luck and good fortune that I was able to find all these recordings and uh, be able to listen to them and tell the reader, you know, what they what they sounded like. Hmm. So, what was it exactly that led Jimmy Nickel to become the choice? Uh, you were telling me when I interviewed you previously that there were some other drummers that were considered. There were, and uh, they were Ray Duval and Bobby Graham, and. Ray Duval had come to the attention of Epstein and Nems because he had played in a, an old band that uh, had appeared on a bill with the Beatles years before in Liverpool. I can't recall the name of the band right now. He was the drummer then, and he had also made a name for himself, and he might still own this record, the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest drum solo. So he was well known for that, and he had done session work and such. And uh, they went down to his club. He owned a club at the time. And, and, and Ray said, you know, I told him I, I didn't want to do it because I had a good thing going. And, and he said, Jim, you know, between you and me, I didn't think those Beatles were going anywhere. They, they didn't impress me. <laughs> wow. So uh, Ray skipped the tour. And then they located Bobby Graham, who was a very well-known uh, session drummer at the time. Very, very well known. Very, I mean, he played on everybody. Somebody was telling me he did all the drum work on the Dave Clark Five albums, or and Dave I, Clark Five songs. And I think the Kinks as well. He did a lot of Kinks mm -hmm. uh, hits of the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was at a time when also Jimmy Page was out there as a, as a session guitarist. And so those two played on a lot of work together. Uh, many of those songs are sort of lost in time because... People didn't record, you know, write down who played on sessions as much back then. But Graham was a great drummer, a great session drummer, and they asked him, and he, he basically said, I, I can't do this because in those days, if you left for two weeks on a tour and you were uh, the first call on these recording sessions, the um, guy Charlie the Fixer, who was in charge of London Sessions, would be, become upset that he couldn't use you for two weeks. And so when you came back, you were invisible to him. And so you had to start at the bottom and work your way up again. And wow. Since it was so lucrative, uh, Graham did not want to 
uh, go on a tour and jeopardize his standing as as one of the first call drummers on big recording sessions. That's interesting. And it's not so that it was shocking. Graham who recommended yeah. um, Jimmy Nickel. I I was going to say that it's really not that shocking that both those men turned down the offer because the Beatles then were the hottest band in the world, but they weren't the Beatles that changed the world yet. <laughs> you know, this was you know they for whatever a year and a half while they invaded England took over, dominated England in 1963, and 64 was the year when they broke big in the world. But, you know, it was a short time, really. They could have just been the flavor of the month. You know, nobody knew that they were going to become what they were. So I think, I think that's an excellent point, Ken. And back then, uh, rock bands and pop bands did have a very short shelf life. So you said Bobby Graham recommended Jimmy recommended Nickel. Recommended Jimmy Nickel. Uh, he said something like, oh, I saw him down in the, in the pub the other day. You might want to look for him. And, and uh, apparently they didn't, like, find him physically down there, so they, they called his uh, Barnes flat and uh, reached him by telephone. Hmm. Now, I thought that Paul McCartney was involved a lot in choosing He was Jimmy. involved in this as well um, because before Jimmy was called, there was discussion amongst in in the Beatles inner circle about Jimmy Nickel and Paul had actually seen Jimmy Nickel perform with Georgie Fame and the Blue Flames in the previous couple weeks and they were like the hottest live band in London at the time and Paul had become friends with Georgie Fame and so according to Georgie Fame Paul called him and said can we borrow your drummer Jimmy and uh, Georgie Fame said sure Paul go ahead and Georgie thought he was going to get him back after the final tour, but that didn't work out for him. But uh, then, at that point, Fame called uh, Georgie. Fame called Jimmy and said, "Do you have a passport?" And Jimmy said, "No." Jimmy didn't even own a suitcase. He had to borrow a suitcase from a buddy that was uh, a singer who was uh, staying with him at the time. <laughs> and uh, and Georgie Fame said, "Well, get down to the post office. You need a." need to get a passport and uh and then shortly after that call george martin called because uh, epstein had told him to give jimmy nickel a, a ring and martin asked him to come down to uh, what is now called abbey road studios jim you indicated in the book that they didn't even consider pete best because uh, and and you had a i think you had a quote from john lennon saying it looked like they were taking him back and it right. wouldn't have been good for him which I, which is a interesting, strange comment. It is. You know, I think that was sort of John Lennon's way of using public relations in a way that made it look like they were being nice. Uh, but the the real truth was that the biggest concern in the inner circle of uh, basically of the people managing the Beatles at the time was they didn't want to find or select a drummer who would create a story in the media that he was going to take over for Ringo. Keep in mind, Ringo had only just replaced Pete Best two years earlier. Now two more years had, go on, had gone on, and they didn't want to have to deal with, well, is, is this person, whoever we select, is he now going to replace Ringo Starr? Uh, so that was one of their big, um, according to Tony Barrow, that was one of their big uh, public relation concerns. Was, was Ringo worried that he might replace him? Well, you know, Ringo has said that he felt strange in, in a few different interviews back, back then in old NME newspapers and also in the uh, anthology. I think he felt a bit insecure because imagine you're the drummer, now you're in the hospital and you're watching your band you know, climb up steps of airplanes and come back down and do press conferences and there's someone else you know, sitting in for you. So I'm sure he had a little bit of concern, but the other Beatles were sending him little telegrams and messages along the way and trying to make him feel good about it. But I think there was some insecurity there. Well, I was going to say, not after he came back, there wasn't. They right. certainly they certainly closed ranks uh, after right. he came back. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But during those two weeks, the Beatles actually, I think, were extremely supportive of him. And one of the things that I found really interesting, I think it was in the Netherlands, 
was that um, when the Beatles went on stage, they were introduced as Jimmy, John, Paul, and George. So Jimmy's name was said first. You know, they were very, uh, very good about that, and I think the Beatles themselves asked that that be done. And also, quite often, if, you, if anyone has bootlegs that they've listened to from that part of the tour, you'll usually hear Paul McCartney saying, you know, we're sorry Ringo is ill, but, you know, let's everybody give Jimmy Nickel a big hand. And you can actually hear them introducing Jimmy. So they weren't trying to hide the fact that Jimmy was their substitute drummer. When you look at all the programs, the newspaper articles and things, there were lots and lots of photos that were already prepared for this tour, for the media, that all have Ringo's picture. So I think the management at NEMS, Epstein's company, were really trying to create this image that, oh yeah, that guy in the back, he's he's Ringo, he's just being kind of quiet, you know, but, but in, in true fact, it was Jimmy Nickel. But yet at the same time, he was included in all the press conferences. That's right. And, you know, one of the things I found when I dug through the archives in Melbourne of the um, Australian concert promoter is that, you know, from all the correspondence back and forth between Epstein and the promoter, every effort was made to make Jimmy feel a part of the whole thing and to feel as if he was a Beatle. There were um, messages that said, make sure Jimmy's in the same car with them in the parades. Make sure Jimmy meets the Lord Mayor along with the Beatles. Make sure he has equal accommodations in the hotel. I mean, there, all, there were a lot of very specific things. There were even diagrams of, uh, you know, who was in what bed and what rooms and all that sort of thing. So a lot of detail went into it, and a lot of effort was, was made uh, so that Jimmy Nickel would feel comfortable on the tour and would feel a part of it. And didn't they share rooms at that point? I mean, because yeah. that's what that's what Greg Lake was telling me that Ringo told him that back on those early tours, there were two Beatles to a room. It wasn't they? They didn't each have their own room. That's exactly what I I found, Steve. Yeah, that it was two and two. Mm-hmm. And Interesting. And there was also the holding room, which which I think Mal Evans was in charge of, charge of where they would bring up uh, young ladies. Mm. and put him in a holding room to meet the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got wow. a, a question here. This is just uh, just veering off a little bit, but I would imagine that when it comes to autographs, there's got to be very few autographs, anything at all, a program, a photograph, or whatever, with John, Paul, George, and Jimmy together. Do you know? Right. Do you know right. what the value of something like that would be in this day and age? And and would the value be high, or less because Ringo's not on it? Well, from what I've seen at auctions, and I've followed that for probably thirty years, or whenever all the Sotheby's and such started to do rock and roll auctions. What's interesting is there's one set of autographs that I put in the book that was very early, like on their first flight or second flight. To the Netherlands, and that's actually a, 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 a set that I own that I had bought for $200 at um, Sotheby's in like 1985 or so. Wow. And it was it had been obtained by the stewardess as they got on, the I think, the first flight, and it was on their airline stationery. But it wasn't complete because I think it's like George, Paul, and Jimmy, so it's just three hmm. of them. But there are very few full sets uh, that really are out there, and I would say they probably nowadays go for oh four to five thousand dollars a piece. Wow! And uh, just because it was such a rare thing, the the most rare would be there are I've seen two examples that were correct and, and not forged Beatle autographs of all five, and so that's probably the rarest. The day that Ringo rejoined them. Uh, some media people were able to get autographs of all five Beatles that day, including Jimmy. So John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Jimmy, and uh, those go for somewhere between ten and twenty thousand mm. dollars. That's got to be a find. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Jimmy's a- exit from the Beatles was not very um, sweet. Um, he had a, a little dust up with uh, Brian Epstein. Did he not? 
Yes, you know, uh, everything was okay when they first met, uh, but then after they went out on the balcony and waved to 300 or so 100,000 fans, they went back down and they went to the press conference. And at the press conference, Jimmy started to feel like that he was the odd man out now, and he started thinking, well, if since Ringo's here, I'm obviously not going to be with the Beatles anymore. I need to start thinking about my solo career and what I'm going to be doing. And uh, a, a reporter engaged him in a converse, sort of a side conversation off at the side of the table that they were at, and he started chatting with him. And you can notice that if you were to watch any of the video of this press conference, which has sort of leaked out over the years. It's interesting because Jimmy's voice is a little too loud. Meanwhile, the other Beatles are, you know, answering all the questions. Nobody's directing any questions from the main media to Jimmy Nickel now that Ringo's back. And Jimmy starts talking, and it's it's sort of uh, annoying because he's sort of interrupting the others. And uh, I think Derek Taylor goes over and asks him to stop uh, talking and Epstein was somewhere in the room, but I don't think he's in the picture. And he was really upset by this and and had a short fuse that day, probably because he had been traveling for 20 hours by plane. And so when the uh, press conference ended, Epstein said, well, that's it, go pack your bags, and tomorrow we're putting you off on the plane. And, and Nichols said, well, you know, I... I was invited to come back to Sydney uh, by this Frances Faye, and she said we might go back to America. Frances Faye was a singer that he had sat in with one night in Sydney on the tour. And so Epstein said, nope, I have a one-way ticket for you back to London, and that's where you're going. Go pack your bags, go to your room. And Jimmy was a very free-spirit, independent person, and he was not, being, he was not used to being talked to that way. And I think he, he was extremely annoyed with Epstein at that point, and he had had free reign to sneak out of hotels and things when Epstein was still back in London. So that night he, you know, sort of rebelled again, his last night as a quote-unquote Beatle, and he went out to a bar, and when Epstein found out he wasn't around uh, at the nightly parties with the others, he uh, sent Neil and Derek out to find him, and they located him, and Jimmy was quite upset, you know, there was this big squeal of cars pulling up and running in, and they said, hey, you can't be here. And he said, why? I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not involved anymore. And they said, you are a beetle until we stick you on the plane tomorrow. <laughs> and so things did not end well between Jimmy and, and Brian Epstein. So that led to other issues where um, I think Nickel felt when his solo career didn't really take off as he had planned that he sort of thought that that Epstein had something to do with that. I want you know I wondered if maybe that kind of carried over into the to the attitude that he exhibited, you know, years later where he you know, and this whole thing of, you know, staying out of the limelight although he has surfaced occasionally. I mean, he right. he's done con- a couple of conventions but I mean, I just wonder if that, especially, you know, in you trying to find him recently, I mean, I just wonder if that's, that you might think that has anything to do with it. Well, it's possible. I, you know, in talking with his um, second wife, Julia, in Mexico, which was, talk about finding a needle in a haystack. <laughs> <laughs> I tried for five years to find out who he married, where he lived. All I knew was somewhere in South America, and he found a girl. I just got lucky by being persistent and uh, finally found some Mexican historians who were just general rock and roll historians. And I wrote to one one day and said, you you mentioned something about Jimmy Nickel in Mexico. Do you know um, his wife? He goes, oh, Julia, here's her phone number and email. (laughs) So that was quite fortuitous. But in talking to her, she said that, the thing that really upset him about that experience was Brian Epstein. That was the the focus, the sole focus. And if you also relate back to, in the book, I talk about how Jimmy's experience with Vince Eager's band 
Vince Eager's band broke up because Vince got into an argument with his manager and his manager blacklisted him. And so I think Jimmy said, well, if Vince was blacklisted, then maybe Brian Epstein blacklisted me. But I really couldn't find any evidence to necessarily support that. Since you mentioned this about Brian and all, it is kind of interesting. One of the most fascinating things about this book and what you told me in a previous interview was that, in fact, Paul McCartney tried to find work for Jimmy and tried to help him. That's exactly right. He, uh, he helped him when Jimmy was bankrupt, divorced, and completely unemployed. And he got him work with uh, Peter and Gordon as a, a tour drummer. How do people get your book? The best way to find the book is to either go to our website, our author site, thebeetlewhovanished.com, or they can also go straight to amazon.com and either uh, search under Jim Birkenstadt or The Beetle Who Vanished. should be in bookstores by June. Okay. And there's a lot more to the story that we haven't even touched on, so I highly recommend picking up this book. And I, Jim, I agree. I agree. Jim, it's been a pleasure having you with us on the show. Well, great, Ken and Steve. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be on the show, and I really um, enjoy talking to you about this. I think we could probably go on for hours. Yeah, I think we could. <laughs> I think we could. <laughs> Let's plan on part two in the near future. Okay, that would be great. That would be great. So thanks so much, everybody, for listening. I'm Ken Michaels for Things We Said Today. Saying see you next time, being joined by my co-host, Steve Marinucci. Steve Marinucci saying see you next time. And Jim Birkenstadt. Jim Birkenstadt saying thanks for having me on, and we'll see you next time.